that no matter what happens as a result of me meeting this person, it's what I do with it that, that decides whether or not it was a success. So I meet this person, we go on one day, I feel rejected, I use my trigger protocol to work through those feelings, perfect, it was a success. I got to I got to work on something I needed to work on. We go out on 10 dates and I'm falling in love, and then I find out they're seeing another three people who are also falling in love with them. Ouch, that hurt. I'll, now I know where the wound is, I'll go straight into that. Perfect, that was a success, thank you very much. Um, and I just think that whole mentality is what you need going into a conscious relationship. Hey, beautiful souls. Welcome to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. Today we have a special guest with us and their name is Mickey and Emma. Now, Mickey and Emma are a relationship consultants and mentors integrating spiritual teachings and practical knowledge to bring clarity and insight into the world of relationships. After a spontaneous Kundalini awakening in 2018, Mickey began to experience tantric gifts which very quickly pulled him to his childhood sweetheart and soulmate Emma, who almost immediately experienced her own Kundalini activation and emergence of gifts. So without further ado, let's bring them on. Hi Mickey and Emma, how are you doing? Hi, really good. You? Good. Yeah, not too bad. And I know you guys moved to Spain, right? Sunny Spain? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> where about sunny today. yeah, whereabouts are you in Spain? We're in Denia, like the southern part on the mainland of Spain. Yeah, amazing. Now, just thinking back where we met, you know, we met like, was it over last year, over a year ago, um, during lockdown, actually, we met on uh, online retreats that you guys were holding and um, and then Mickey went to Spain and me and Emma actually went on a walk uh, to Dovestone Reservoir. Wow. We connected, we had some insights, we had so much fun, we, you know. Um, and it's just amazing how we we met because now I'm in, on your uh, relationship course. Because <laughs> <So, laughs> you guys are experts, are experts, are amazing. Like, you know, the not, I'm sure we're going to find out more about your story, but, you know, every time I see you guys, it's just incredible because, you know, I've never seen a love like yours, you know, and um, I've always had a different, oh, love has to be this, this, that way. And, you you know, every single day you guys surprise me. <laughs> mm -hmm. Aww. Aww, beautiful. Thank oh. you. Yeah, so uh, obviously I know who you are and our listeners don't know who you are. So could you tell us a bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, so I'm Emma. Um, I am 39 years old. Um, like you said, we're living in Spain. Uh, for most of my adult life, I've been a registered nurse, um, living in the UK um, up until I was about 24, and then moving to the US. And I have spent like 13 years living there. From a relationship standpoint, I've been married twice and divorced twice. Um, and then this is my third relationship now uh, with Mickey. That's a little bit about me. Um, so I'm 38, just a little bit younger than Emma. <laughs> Let's get that um, <laughs> um, I've lived quite a colourful life. I've travelled quite a lot and spent a lot of time um, having parties with friends and things like that. And then had a quite a big spiritual awakening a couple of years ago that really did like change the, the direction of my life. Mm. Uh, so that brought us to where we're at now. Oh, amazing. Cool. What about the, could you t briefly tell us about the course that you're offering right now? Yeah, go on. Yeah, so um, we essentially have one course um, and we call it Awakening in Relationships and it's on an online platform. So it's the ability to um, to take the course that way in like a self-paced course. And then we also have it where we run it live, which is what you are on Medea. Yeah. Um, and then we also do it that way. Um, plus we do it with, um, you know, one on one time with us. And the course is very much about, um, you hear about spiritual awakening, mm -hmm. you know, where people all of a sudden kind of the blinkers come off and it's a whole, whole new world that they've discovered. And we feel that the course is, is, is that in relationships. Um, 
because we're not really taught anything, are we, about relationships? It's all very much, you kind of thumb, fumble through the dark and hope you do a kind of good enough job. It, you know, it either reflects somewhat of what your parents did or it's a massive 180 of that because you would never want to do that. Um, but normally it's very much where you're just kind of fuddling along and, and kind of doing the best that you can with, with whatever it is that you're given. Uh, so we really want to open people's eyes to um, different possibilities and a, a different awareness, but for ultimately for them to pick whatever kind of relationship works for them, but just to um, to get together, you know, reimagine what a relationship could look like. That's really what we want everyone to get from the course, to get excited, especially if they've been single maybe for a long time, but get excited about the prospect of getting back out to that date, you know, into the dating world and um, yeah, that's... To be able to go in with excitement instead of fear. The, yeah. Oh, what if this goes wrong? What if that goes wrong? What if they don't like me? What if I find out I don't like them after a little while? And, and so much anxiety around it and... Uh, and then in the relationship, even if it does go well, we find a lot of people just really don't thrive in there and they have communication difficulties and don't understand why they're often falling out or disagreeing over things. And um, it's just a huge, like we say, like an awakening in that area. So we can see really clearly, ah, so I'm behaving like this because of this, this, this and this. They're behavior, behaving like they are because of, that that and that mm -hmm. and then when we come together we butt heads we fall out we or we don't say anything and we go quiet and then yeah. nothing's happening yeah. so it can go both ways well we'll talk about your course and um of the relationship as <laughs> um I, in a bit but how did you guys meet then because i feel like you guys i know you don't like saying twin flames but i, I definitely do <laughs> think you are twin flames you have a journey of a twin flame <laughs> yeah. uh, well i'll let you tell the story i feel like he's a better storyteller than uh, i am so i'll <laughs> let him tell it now i can get all gushy as i listen to it well i mean it is it the first time i heard that that term twin flame i'd never heard it before um but it was when i was relaying just after i would met emma actually the second time around as adults so i'll come to that in a second and um, but i was just relaying the story to someone and they were like oh my god you found your twin flame and i was like oh, my what and she's like you don't know what one is mm. and i said no what so anyway she went, you need to look it up and when i looked up it was like 20 sign you know what you find online right yeah, 20 yeah. signs you found your twin flame and it was just exactly a textbook from beginning to end um the only resistance i have to these words is i just i, I try and avoid buzzwords where possible i don't know why <laughs> it's just something i've always done but I, I i see what you're saying um so how we met was um i was brought up in a, a city the city of bradford in the uk and i lived there for the first 10 years of my life and then at that point, we moved over to a different town, to, to a town called Halifax. And this was about three months before the end of junior school, right? First school. And as soon as I walked in, uh, into the school, I remember there was a lot of eyes, you know, it's like new kid comes right at the end of the year. It's so all the eyes were on me and um, a lot of people wanted to get to know me and things like that. And with me being called Mickey, right? And Emma's nickname was Minnie and she went to that school and everyone would go, Mickey, I'm Minnie. And they were pointing at us both. And, and basically they were putting us together, weren't they? And she always had a, a purple t-shirt on with a Minnie Mouse on the front, I remember. Uh, so yeah, we were 10, about 10 at this point, right? Last year of high school, uh, of junior school. So I think we were like 10 years old. And so we kind of got pulled together and that we were there for about a year or so um constantly walking around like this with his arms around each other and <laughs> kissing in the bus shelter i remember um riding bikes going for walks playing out climbing trees all of it weren't it um sneaking the... into his bedroom <laughs> <laughs> the one thing i remember is um just running onto emma's house like every day, you know, as soon as I'd finished school or whatever, just getting my clothes on and just running as fast as I could to get to her house. Um, so that's that's how we met the first time around. Second time around? You want me to say Yeah. All right. So second on, time yeah. around, I mean, it's 25, 20, almost 26 years later. Mm. So by this point, um, Mickey had moved to Spain and I was living in America. And um, just very impromptu, because 
I decided to go home to England for four days over Christmas. And, you know, going home for four days is no easy feat. You know, I, I'm a, like, um, really busy nurse working 12, 13 hours days, but I managed to swing it so I could get four days off. So I just felt this really big pull to go home for Christmas. And at the same time, Mickey's mum and sister surprised him with a flight home um, to England for Christmas. And so it was, you know, unexpected for him as well. And then um, I'd been home two days so far at this point and then went out on a girls' night out with my friends and sisters. And in the local pub, which is the pub that Mickey's mum owns, was Mickey. He was there. Um, and so he just beelined over. But he knows my family anyway, so he knows my sisters really, really well. Um, you know, obviously from, from our childhood. Um, so I came over and he started speaking and I was like completely speechless. I looked over at my sister, I was like, help me out, like <laughs> I have no clue, I don't even know what to say. Um, totally unexpected and um, it was just cataclysmic honestly from there. I really, really felt like we were puppets, um, you know, like we were just being orchestrated seriously. It's, it's a very... Um, it's a very difficult thing to describe, you know, just how powerful this was. Mm. Um, but it was a beautiful, beautiful reunion, if you like, you know, going from 10 years old to here we are as adults. So that was Emma's end. Um, what was happening at my end was, um, how much of the story do you want? How long have we got? Okay. <laughs> um, to edit what you need. <laughs> <clears throat> Okay, so let's just start at 2018, um, which was a time around a big a, a awakening, probably phase three, you know, and we awaken in different phases, don't we? Yeah. And that was a real big um, awakening at that point in, in 2018, a Kundalini activation. Um, so this is what made me think probably yes to the Twin Flame thing that you, that you um, talk about a lot. Um, because they often follow Kundalini activation is what I've heard. Yeah. Right. So sort of when I've read about it, it sometimes happens that way. Um, so in 2018, the body starts to do movements by itself at this point, it starts to do yogic postures and things like that. Um, and then I moved from, I was in, um, what's it called? Marbella doing an ayahuasca retreat. And then from there, I moved to Ibiza. I didn't know where I was going in life, didn't know what to do, didn't know where to put my energy, had no direction. The business that I worked for had just gone bankrupt um, back in the UK. So I'd just flown off to Marbella in Spain to go to this retreat. And at this point, I was kind of like, right, what ha whatever happens after here, I have no idea. One foot in front of the other and we'll see. And then after there, I decided to fly back to Ibiza, which is where another Spanish island, um, one of the Balearics where I used to live. And I flew back over there to see some friends and I started to get lots of revelations, one after another, you know, like insights, downloads, people call them, just understandings, more of these movements, mm. um, visions and things like that. And over the course of probably that retreat was the 11th to the 22nd of July and we met on the 28th of December. So there wasn't a huge gap between um, this retreat and us coming together again. Um, so while I was, while I was in Ibiza, there was like a series of, of moments and you know, when you get those moments and they kind of, it's like a real strong synchronicity or mm. just something that you think this is significant. I need to make a note of this. Or if you get really emotional for me, if I get really emotional and I feel like I want to cry and it's something really odd, like something that's not obviously why um, it's not something that is an obvious reason why it bring me to tears. When that happens, I kind of know that it's a spiritual communication when I get these butterflies and this like strong emotion. Mm. And so I, I, I were writing these moments down, these things, these little lessons in my phone, right? Just in the, the notes. And I had no idea I was waiting for anybody. It, like I said, it wasn't on my radar. Mm. I was quite freshly single. And for me, it was all about um, making spirituality my number one, not a relationship. And this was actually one of the steps that I found led us together was not needing a relationship, not even really wanting one particularly, but just 
experiencing love from source, really, really deeply connecting to, to source, to my guides, which um, is another story altogether, but I'd kind of met my guides on that retreat, so I, I then had this nice connection. And then there was another thing, and then another thing, like some raw models, people who I saw, and it was like, uh, I want that relationship. Real examples of a really beautiful conscious relationship, and I were thinking, I want a relationship like that. Mm. I get that, I want one like that. Yeah. And then there was, earn moment of just realizing my own value in a relationship what I had to offer and then there was the truth and the realization that I don't have to go out and find them I can call it in and uh, so there were several steps that I'd written down and as they all came together I just remember <laughs> one night I were reading uh, conversations with God really oh, yeah. really good book love um, that book yeah. it's amazing it's a part in book two about Tom and Mary and and it's it's talking about how couples come together, how they unite, and it's saying there's Tom and Mary, right? So um, imagining that they're going to come together. Now, what what the book is saying is they already meet first energetically, and then they're both drawn towards the essence of Tom and Mary combined, which it calls Tom Mary, mm. Tom Mary, right? So it's, and it says, and they're both drawn to that like moths to a flame. And then when they come together, they'll feel all the vibrations in the body, they get the butterflies, they feel the sensations in the genitalia, they want to mate, they want to sleep together. And um, and it was when I read that, something clicked. And I was and I realised what all this was, all this list that, that I'd been writing down. And I was, and I said, I'm ready, like, bring it to me. I didn't know I was waiting for somebody, but I was like, and I was in, yeah. like, no rush whatsoever. I've got my thing. I don't know where I'm going in life right now. I don't have my direction fully sorted yet. I knew it was going to be helping people. I knew it was going to be some kind of coaching or, you know, uh, something similar, some sort of mentoring. So I was going down that road and I said, yeah, bring it to me. Cool. And I says, but just give me another sign. Give me a really big sign, an obvious sign. And uh, yeah, it was really funny when we first met. Yeah. I think we'd spoken for seconds, seconds. And Emma's got this beautiful tattoo and it goes all the way up. I don't know if you can Amazing. see it there. Um, <laughs> and she had a big gap on the other side. And I said to her, um, what, are you got, what are you getting in that gap? There was just a gap. Oh, beautiful tattoo. What's going in the gap? And she went, a feather. Now, probably should have mentioned before, I've been finding feathers everywhere since I met my spirit guides. Everywhere I was looking, there were feathers, feathers, feathers. Mm. And um, in very specific places. So, you know, like odd places at odd times or specific times where it got to the point where I I were, weren't very spiritual at this point, by the way. I, I was, but not, not angels and things like that. For me, it was all just about oneness and kind of getting my head around spirituality. It was spiritual intelligence. But at this point, it became like a real, a real thing. And I remember actually Googling at this point, why do I keep finding feathers everywhere? I thought it must be a sign. Why do I keep finding feathers? Mm. Yeah, and when it said, um, it's your angels. And I was like, oh yeah, feathers, yeah. angels. I've just <laughs> met, met these guys, makes perfect sense. There's actually, so yeah, when I saw it. It's, it's actually, in, um, what you call it, um, feathers and numbers. It's known for twin flame as well. Like, um, I could just briefly talk about my experience, like really brief, like um, when I met mine. Uh, now, twin flames are very tricky topic because, you know, you feel that energy before they enter the, your life. And then when they, they enter your life, it's like great. And then it's like chaos. One of them runs and the other one kind of chases and that goes back and forth, push and pull until in all of that. So what was happening is healing to, uh, within themselves. So um, the conscious one who <laughs> wakes up first, actually, the one who chases <laughs> wakes up as the one is more materialistic and not even looking at that trash and yeah and then once the the one that's chasing stops it's like no like i feel great without you i, mean, I don't want a relationship or anything you kind of just balance it all out and apparently that's when the union sort of thing happens and i guess the same thing happened with you when um you you kind of woke up 
uh, to a fact that you don't need anybody. You know, you don't want anybody. And that's when the right person comes anyway. <laughs> it's just a bit like, yeah. I'm too busy with my life and I'm not do I'm, I, I don't want to uh, deal with relationships. I don't want relationships. I don't have time for them. And that's when the right person comes. That's the mm-hmm. test, whether you can work, work at it or not. Because if you can't, then the right person goes and then you're like, okay, I'm actually looking for it. You're trying to, okay, there's a toxic person again. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what you just said there? I, I actually really resonate with when you said you can see them, uh, you can feel them before you meet. Mm. I just remember seeing my Facebook posts, going back and looking at my Facebook posts before we met, and I was on a real, real significant high. Felt absolutely amazing. You know, I was I, I was just in such a good space in my life. Mm. Um, and like I said, when I was just said, "Oh, bring it to me," and something just felt like high but i didn't know it was twin flame maybe that's what i would have been thinking about if i'd have heard this term yeah i mean the twin flame um label is just is to put a a label on a connection that we can't even describe (laughs) properly you know it's so intense you know when i met mine uh, like i said i felt her energy before and then um i actually met but then it was like great chaos 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 and then i had my spiritual awakening went on to and that's where it is like you know um but the thing with twin flames is like you don't uh you know some of them aren't meant to be in there together in the same lifetime it could be another lifetime so if you're moved on and gone that's it it's done you there may be other soulmates who will fulfill that love for you um so um you know going into conscious relationship what is conscious relationship um, so to me, a conscious relationship um, is really, really quite different from one that is just kind of existing. There's a lot of intention behind a conscious relationship, and it really takes two people to to make one. Um, so the intention essentially is all about growing and evolving and being the best version that we can be individually, but then also together as a couple. Um, so I would say that's like one of the main main focus is what a conscious relationship like anything that comes up for me and Mickey we see it as an opportunity we don't see it as a source of conflict um, or something to be seen as negative we just see it as this beautiful opportunity and then with with love we together look at this thing to see what we can do with it whether what what it what it's asking for um you know but ultimately it's all about all about growth and developing and us um it's a lot about purpose as well. It's um, joining joining what we're both here to do on the planet and to be that force together as a couple and to, to yeah, radiate that out as far and as wide as we can. Um, and, um, I mean, just a little one, just that's personal to us, is to have a conscious baby as well, like, you know, to, mm. to birth that into the world. Oh, yeah, and, Leo, uh, Mickey and Emma's conscious baby. <laughs> <laughs> that's the hope. That's the plan. Yeah. Would you add to that? Yeah, what would I say about a conscious relationship? The main thing that I would say about it is um, the textbook, other than conscious relationship, is one where we meet somebody, and we get really close and we're meeting each other's needs a lot, right? The honeymoon period, yeah, um, everything's getting ticked. We're spending so much time together, quality time. We're touching each other, we're making a lot of love. We're giving each other a lot of affection, attention. And, and so suddenly we feel like all our needs are being met. And any feelings that we had of deficiency or I'm not lovable or I'm not worthy seem to be gone for a little while as someone showers you with all this affection. But what's happening during this time is not sustainable there's you know it's it's that's not how the relationship is always going to be that someone's always going to be throwing themselves at you because you know what it's like right when you're in that stage of a relationship like you get nothing done can't stop thinking about the other person all the time every time your phone goes off you get excited and you um you know get butterflies and stuff like that and you just it's not sustainable and the chemicals that cause that wear off and so that can be up to about two years and that, that this lasts if you're lucky i guess because it is a, a beautiful stage yeah um well a conscious relationship instead of going up hitting that point and then going down the conscious relationship continues to go up so we'll go through the honeymoon period but during that time we know each other really deeply we know exactly what each other are up, up against what our deepest difficulties are because um, we all have our own difficulties right 
Um, we understand what the other person really needs. We understand how the other person likes to be loved. So we just study each other with things like the love languages that I know you know about and um, other methods of kind of communication. And communication. Some people use non-violent communication. Mm. Uh, but the, what we say is the honeymoon period is an amazing time mm. to, to do that, to get to know each other to the point that when that honeymoon period wears off, which it inevitably does, you're still then really, really close. You understand each other to the point that you're not going to have petty arguments. You realise there's, there's more going on than that. So that's what a conscious relationship is for me. Right. And that we work together. Same team, always. Same team, yeah. yeah. Same team. We do say that all the time. If anything comes up, you know, we look at each other and you know, if we can see that one person is, um, you know, is, is yeah. triggered, then we say, you know, let's look at this together, same team. And it, it definitely makes, you know, the whole energy around it shifts, you know, because obviously when a lot of conflict comes up in relationship, the first thing you do is want to get defensive and, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and retreat a little bit. And it's, you know, it, it's it's understandable, but obviously the whole goal is to, to move us forward because how many relationships, they're having the same argument a lot of times over and over. It's often, you know, a, a one or two common themes that they're, they're kind of spinning on and to be able to move beyond that as a couple and to you know to transcend beyond it is a beautiful thing to get to do obviously for for, for everybody for everyone around you you know to not be not be arguing and yeah absolutely um, so yeah i would say that like uh, in a couple well imagine as a single person that your reality is about as big as the things that trigger you, if that makes sense. So for example, if you look over there and you see someone eating a certain way and that triggers you, that puts you back in your head. You're like, oh, that's so annoying. That person's doing that straight away. You can't see anything else. Reality disappears to you. It's just that thing. And I really feel like this is what goes on anyway. So my life has been about for quite a few years now, just about letting go of things that trigger me. So if something's triggering, just to go into it, face it head on, allow it to be there, use a certain protocol to heal it. Now, as a, a couple, we, it's, we do that together. So it's let's work together to dissolve all these triggers. And every time you dissolve triggers, your life gets a little bit bigger and then a little bit bigger because there's not things in close proximity that are, that are triggering this response that puts us in our heads. And so you just find the world seems like a more accessible place like traveling and moving around and um, I seem to take more in, opportunities are more visible and it's because we're not triggered all the time. So in a conscious relationship, it's the two of us working together to resolve all the triggers that mm. keep us small, right? And limited and stuck and yeah. stressed. And I guess it's, uh, it's really important to uh, be with someone who is on a spiritual path, I guess, like because... Um, you know, when you're dealing with triggers, if you if two people get together, say, for example, you know, they have no idea what attachment styles is, they have no idea what their triggers and their patterns are, uh, it's going to turn into a toxic relationship because they have no idea how to deal with it, you know. Um, whereas yeah. two conscious people coming together, you know, they know about the attachments. Okay, I'm more anxious. I'm more avoidant. How can we work with that? You know, uh, they say that the anxious and the uh, avoidant, it's, it's, it's hard to maintain that relationship. But when you know your uh, 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 like styles or, you know, you can work through them. It's not, you don't always have to seek a secure person. If you feel like connection, you can work through it. And relationships uh, is uh, it's probably the most growth. <laughs> you can get the most growth in relationships uh, than outside of it. <laughs> because the trigger's going up my Absolutely. left, right and center. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely yeah. agree with that. Well, no one knows you as best normally is what your partner does and so they'll know your kind of weak spots if you want to refer to them like that or where your wounds are um, I think we've probably all had instances in a relationship where someone said something they've really cut deep because they knew that thing about you yeah. Um, yeah. and what we want to say as well about being on the same team it's when we use that data if you want to call it data to be thoughtful about the other person rather than to manipulate the other person you know, so we, everything we know about them, we use it to help them not and to understand them, not to use as a weapon in an argument, mm -hmm. uh, which obviously happens a lot, doesn't it? Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, we're just, we're just about becoming more thoughtful. So, um, 
can you give us any more tips of um, if there are conflicts in a conscious relationship, what are, what sort of thing that they could do like um, step by step yeah. or how to deal with it? Um, probably the, the first thing is, is deeply understanding uh, what's yours and what's theirs and taking 100% responsibility for your part in things is probably the first thing because if you're really not clear on on or owning your part in things then it's it's really difficult to to look at something together if there's a lot of blame there and if you're coming from that place so i'd say take 100 percent responsibility which when you do that properly um then you're not going to project that onto somebody else and so that's you know the other massive piece isn't it yeah um what else would you want I would to say, say so yeah there's taking 100% responsibility being on the same team obviously mm-hmm. absolutely be on the same team um I would say there's something about non-verbal communication that I really like I think that sometimes we just need to be close mm-hmm. whether that's making eye contact whether that's hugging whether that's just gently just maybe putting our hands on the other person's shoulder or back just intuitively mm. and i know that's something we've done quite a lot isn't it just sometimes it's not there's no point talking about it mm. um mm-hmm. because we kind of let's say you've already come to understand where each other sit on an issue sometimes it's like okay there's nothing to say about it you can just hold each other um the other thing that i would say for communicating or for a healthy conscious relationship is there's a particular thing that we're all all up against now when you know what your partner's is you know how to navigate that you know where they're coming from um i'm trying to make this simple without using any lingo um (laughs) that's the tricky part sometimes i want to talk to the version of Emma, that's the deepest version of her, to her essence. Mm. And recognizing what she's up against that's causing the personality. It's all about personality typing, right? And when we speak to, for example, if I speak to the little girl in Emma, um, the a co- an old coping mechanism that's wounded, that's who I bring forward. If I speak to her essence, that's what I bring forward. If I speak to someone who's in a bad mood, that's who I bring forward. Whatever I'm expecting to see in Emma and I'm speaking to that person, it brings it out and vice versa, obviously. So I think in a relationship, if it's being careful to speak to the version of your partner that you want, mm-hmm. because I know for a fact there's certain people who will be a nightmare for one person in a relationship and not at all for another. Mm. And that's the same person. Might be a nightmare in one and really lovely in the other. And it's because it's how they've been treated, who who they've been who's been brought out of them. And so to give you an example, um I have a, a friend who who has had a lot of trouble with a particular lady and she, when I speak to this lady, she's always really, really nice, really kind and and he's like, I don't understand it. Why? How can you get on so well with this this lady? I'm like, I don't know. I just I can't imagine not getting on with her at all. You know, I can't really imagine it. And I just realised that it is over the years that it is when, if 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 you've already got a grudge and you're speaking to them in this way through the grudge that you have, they pick up on that and respond from that place, become defensive, become arrogant, become abusive, become um, or just upset, manipulative. Mm. So yeah, talk talk to the conscious being in each other. Talk directly to that and that's what will come out in the relationship. I'd say actually maybe if we just did that alone, all of us with everybody, the world would change pretty quickly. Mm. As all the personalities started to fall away, all the coping mechanisms and the essence shone forward. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned a, a really awesome thing about um, non-communication when you know you dealt with it. Now, for people who aren't dealing with uh, the issues, then it's so important to communicate, right? Like the importance of communication is key. And I feel like I, I mm-hmm. many of our listeners, and including myself, we I, we lack in this. <laughs> I lack in this. Uh-huh. Like, you know, communication before I was like very good at it. But then 
as time went by I kept getting hit in um you know in dating and so I just kind of went in my cave and I'm this is where I am now it's like I will not communicate whether I like you or not I, w- I won't communicate so maybe some of some of our listeners are in the same situation what what steps could I do and or listeners do um to open that communication and look this is how I feel and this is what I want to say to you yeah and I think definitely always be true to yourself whatever it is that you do want to communicate but I would just what we um, teach is to go through a process we refer to it as the trigger process or opportunity process so you know to look at yourself before you communicate so if you are you know loads of things are coming up you can feel your heart racing you know your mind all over the place don't jump on your phone at that moment you know don't don't communicate that because it's probably not going to come from a true place you might end up regretting whatever it is that you wrote and then and, and then just going into a, a kind of downward spiral with that so I would say just um, take your time and just really get centered before you do communicate and then it'll come from a more grounded place and you know if you put that you are into somebody and they were not ready to hear that you know if you if that's true for you and that was right I would say go and go ahead and honor that they're they're not where you are and they you know they can't meet you there and then you've just saved yourself a bunch of time it's like okay thank you for that and thank you for letting me know that you know and then if obviously if that you know, the fact that they don't, they're not interested. If that brings up something else in you, that's another opportunity to look at something else that that's them bringing up. But I would still honor, honor yourself. And, you know, when, when you're wanting to communicate, whatever it is that, that you do. Um, but if you're arbitrarily just kind of shooting off texts and kind of all over the place when you're doing it, maybe that might be a time where you want to dial it back a little bit and just take a little bit of time before you jump straight to your phone. I'm just using phone, for example, because we live on them, don't we? But, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, yeah. and I know it's not an easy thing to do. I make it, it might sound easy, um, you know, and it might be a stepwise process for you to do it. And you might you might find that off. Oh, freaking hell I just sent that text and I were like so triggered in that moment I was so all over the place and it's like it's okay you know we're human it's all right it's like you've caught it you've caught the fact that you did that so maybe next time you know have another opportunity to approach it differently and 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 start over Mm -hmm. you know yeah and kind of similar to what you're saying for me I would say especially in dating we're talking dating now as opposed to relationships in dating I've probably scared a lot of people off really really quickly because i do just <laughs> absolutely just talk about whatever interests me and i just be completely myself and lay it on thick and if they don't like it that's mm. i'm happy about that yeah i mean that's i was not on me. the spiritual path whatsoever and when we met he was talking about ayahuasca and these spiritual beings and all of this i'm like <laughs> well this guy's you know pretty out there but he was I, again puppies it didn't matter what he said I was like, oh. <laughs> so after it. yeah we were talking we were talking about afterlife within minutes of meeting weren't we in a crowded yeah. pub yeah well you know um, well, with the right person obviously everything's cool <laughs> i mean with the wrong person oh my god no way <laughs> Well, someone just said to us recently that they sent off a message and it was all heartfelt and it was, you know, very spiritual based and like, you know, how they, um, you know, know things to be true. And the other person were like, what the hell is this? Like, Mm. it was so not on that wavelength and, um, you know, and it was interesting to see that that di- you know that dynamic play out but it's like that's just such a massive you've just saved yourself a bunch of time you know yeah. that that they're just not on your wavelength and nor do they want to meet you there and that's cool like that's yeah. fine this but still it. honor yourself isn't it don't don't change yourself if that is your heart and soul and where your path is heading you know don't don't yeah. change yourself to fit them i would absolutely say that come from the heart come from the soul even if you have an attachment style as long as you know not making it the, the other person's fault you know let's say you're anxious attached as long as you're not thinking they're running away or they're ignoring you or they're playing hard to get as long as you realize it's not that they're doing that it's that i i'm expecting too much of them i'm expecting more um 
but then you, you know you can be open about it say oh yeah i do inundate people with messages don't worry you don't have to get back to me and stuff that's just it's just what i do and then on it and then just when, when you're feeling these feelings of like oh i wish they were messaging me back and they're not doing and you're checking your phone exactly what emma said you have a protocol you have a trigger process so you use that and go ah perfect i've got an opportunity to heal this thing and every single time you experience it you chip away at that wound using a trigger protocol uh, what we call trigger opportunity we put the words together trigger opportunity protocol opportunity in capitals so that it makes that association i'm triggered opportunity go through the process chip away when you feel better oh cool okay i've done i've worked through a bit of that stuff and then you can like you said you can contact them at that point and um but i really would say don't try to be something we're not at the beginning of a relationship mm little bits here and there we show our better sides or we might hold a few things back that are just things that are inappropriate to share too soon like maybe yeah. you don't want to discuss your wildest sexual fantasy the first time you meet maybe that's not on the table but <laughs> no. maybe yeah. maybe a couple of weeks down the line you're saying you can... that because he asked me that the first night we were together <laughs> Straight for it. She told me straight up. <laughs> so you don't hold back this one. Yeah. What, what, I, really I mean, like, to get to know you. I'm, I normally just, when I'm on dates with someone or something, I'm the one who just open up about everything, really. There's nothing to, I, I would say, I can't hide the fact that I'm this, that, the other. I just say, okay, this is my life, you know, I used to be caring and, and with, I am caring for my mom and this, that, and the other. And some people ghosted me for it. Some people majority of time people did ghost me for it you know but um without even realizing that i am free as a as a as a bird you know i don't it's not like i'm cooped up you know inside my mom's place and looking after her um so people just judge really quickly because i feel like we live in an instant uh instant world where you know like all the online dating and all that jazz you know you're swiping really quickly and you're like judging people really 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 quickly one date gone second date no not feeling it she said this she wore the wrong shoes or he wore the wrong shoes and we're not going on a second date <laughs> it's like this we, we're not patient enough to build something you know and plus there's so many options out there that you know it's just i don't know how people can build something and when there's so many options out there <laughs> yeah. Yeah. i mean yeah with this it sounds perfect what you're saying if you go out and you let them know exactly who you are that sounds perfect yeah. what might be a slight improvement in that area might be if you were more picky about or more selective about who you went with so instead of like choosing and this, I'm not just saying you, but just in general, what often people will do is if they get thrown a few breadcrumbs of affection, they go, oh, oh, potential love, and they, they dive onto it, right? And they, and they want more, more, more. And so because they do that, they latch onto anybody who looks at them. Mm. And, and especially if this person's really pretty as well, like you are then a lot of people are going to be looking at you right and so so there's an opportunity to, to kind of spend time and date a lot of people but if, if you're not selective there's no way you're going to be compatible with all of them so you're going to get quote unquote rejected turned down or whatever loads of times because you're yeah. going on a lot of dates with a lot of people and you're not compatible with a lot of people or everyone so yeah, um i would I say just be well. more selective in the first place yeah that's what i find as well because like even on when i'm on this date inside there's so many matches just pop up <laughs> and it's like i can't keep up with all of them you know it's like talking to her hi how are you hi how are you? <laughs> it's like i cannot do uh, it you know just like okay let me just get to know this person first okay that didn't work. <laughs> okay okay <laughs> that one yeah. i'm just i just don't work like that it's just too many options it's like i can't deal with it universe just send me the right person and that's it <laughs> <laughs> just just send me one, <laughs> one just send me one, one not so many <laughs> <laughs> and can they have a big arrow over the head pointing <laughs> saying <laughs> this one <laughs> <laughs> you've got to ask for the sign oh my god yeah, i am um, yeah <laughs> <laughs> i uh I've, i think when i say be selective as well it doesn't mean don't date i was still dating and seeing people but there was just zero expectation it was purely for the sake of in fact when i was doing that i'm off confidence you know people go speed dating just to build their own confidence um 
So I was kind of doing that, going out and picking up, but really just for confidence. You know, there was nothing in it. I weren't expecting anything. We weren't even expecting to sleep together at the end of the night. It was just um, building the confidence to approach people and just talk. And so I was doing a lot of that when we met. Um, so I think that expectation is a big deal. If, if you're expecting every day to go further as well, that's when you feel rejected, isn't it? Whereas if you're just going on the date for the sake of having a good night and you don't care if anything happens afterwards, mm. um, that's damage limitation as well. Uh, so yeah. you're not always putting everything, all your eggs in one basket and then feeling like all your world's been collapsed when they've taken that potential away so yeah yeah absolutely so you talked about compatible a uh, few times there how do we know how can we tell if we're comp compatible with someone i think you know this is coming up um, quite a bit lately because we've been doing something called the four quadrants and i think one of the ways that you can know if you're compatible with somebody is when you know really really clearly what you want and then you will know whether, you know, when you put yourself out there, like you were saying, and you would describe that this is who I am, this is what I do, this is what my vision is for my life, you know, all of these things. And I think if you know yourself really, really well, then you would just literally need to have a conversation and just based on the few things that they say, whether they fall into that or whether they don't, then I think that's a massive part of compatibility. But I think majority of people, don't really know what they what they want in a relationship. I, that's where I said in the beginning, I think we just kind of fumble into it and think, oh, you're hot, you know, yeah, you look all right. I think that that can work. That would definitely me in my past two relationships. If I would have thought about compatibility back then, I was definitely not gonna have babies. I, um, you know, my, my uh, first husband really didn't want to travel that much. He um, was really quite an old fashioned kind of guy. The values and ethics that he had were very old fashioned to me. You know, if I would have thought about these things ahead of time, there was no way we were compatible for a long, a long term relationship. Mm. So I think for, from a long term relationship standpoint, compatibility, I think if you get to know what it is that you want, <clears throat> then you'll fast know if they're, if they're you know, a, a, you know part of your world like I know Mickey when we met he was so clear about this is where he was going to be living most likely um, not that these weren't like fixed and not open to discussion but he was very clear on this is what I want my life to look like this is the vision that I have and what do you think where do you fit in that do you think that you do do you like the sound of that and it was literally everything that I'd ever dreamed of like even my family could corroborate like that's what she said she's always wanted and it was like absolutely that and so, you know, in addition to obviously the physical side of things, that attraction needs to be there. Um, then you add all those other pieces and then it's, I think that's where you know you've got some really true compatibility um, between you. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Um, what would I add to that? I would say let's, this is kind of, it's relevant. It's a little bit of a tangent, but you'll see what I mean. It is relevant. It's, I think it's time that we re redecide what relationship means and what a relationship is All right and i'll tell you what i mean by, by that so if you look at it most relationships fail i know on our on our course we were showing a compatibility matrix yeah. showing a, like who's compatible with who and how that works <coughs> excuse me and i remember one of the participants saying well i don't like this model at all because according to this hardly anyone's compatible with anyone i was like <laughs> yeah that's that that's the truth she's like but it says that all relationships will fail I'm like they pretty much all do there's a really tiny fraction of relationships that actually that are not only um the, the way they not only stay together for a long period of time but actually it's healthy as well so let's say um for a lot of people we might have an average of probably five to ten partners in a lifetime um, from kids and we date a little bit and you know might spend a couple of years with one person a few years with another and then we might settle on one and then we get married and then and then potentially what happens then further down the line is you either stay together or you get divorced and then you might have another partner and a second marriage and things like that so I think there's there's at least a couple of handfuls on average for most people of partners in their life and so if they're really, really lucky or on it and they've done a lot of inner work, one of those relationships will go the distance mm. and it'll be healthy. So that's even just based on those arbitrary numbers. I just kind of pulled them out of a hat. But that's that would show that there's only one in 10 makes it and it might not even be healthy. So what I want to talk about is like 
changing what we think a relationship is, what it's for. Like, is it always to go the distance? If that's the case, then the whole system is massively broken because mm. that's not what relationships do. What they definitely do is evolve us. They heal us, they show us things we needed, they carry us. So let's say we're going through this journey of life and someone comes in, holds our hand through this period of it. And then they're like, okay, we've been through that. I need to go off and do this now. You go off and do that. Mm. And then someone else will come and hold our hand for another chapter. And then someone else comes. And I think the moment we look at it like that, that changes things. That changes how we show up in a relationship. That changes... Um, it changes why we how we show up in the relationship and why we show up in the relationship in the first place. Dating becomes something different. So we're not always needing it to be the one. We don't need everybody to be the one. We recognise that some relationships are going to be for a season. Mm. You know, what is it they say? Some for a reason, some for a season, some for a lifetime or something like that. Mm. And so I think if we want to get set ourselves free in the world of relationships and dating, that's a good place to be coming from. That no matter what, happens as a result of me meeting this person it's what i do with it that that decides whether or not it was a success so i meet this person we go on one day i feel rejected i use my trigger protocol to work through those feelings perfect it was a success i got to i got to work on something i needed to work on we go out on 10 dates and i'm falling in love and then i find out they're seeing another three people who are also falling in love with them ouch that hurt uh, now I know where the wound is. I'll go straight into that. Perfect. That was a success. Thank you very much. Um, and I just think that whole mentality is what you need going into a conscious relationship. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You you just uh, said it perfectly then where um, I often say this as well. It's like all all the people that's come into my life or an, anyone's life is like there for, for a reason. So for you to grow, then they go and then you learn something and then they come again. Another person It's like it's it feels like um, if it isn't the right. Well, I keep saying right, right person, then it's a preparation for the right person. You know, um, mm -hmm. so, you know, um, each time it didn't work out, it took me a long time to get the get to this place because I was always like, oh, my God, they're leaving me because I, I'm I was mostly anxious attached. And it was like I, I had abandonment issues. They left me or oh, they don't they're not interested in me and this, that and the other. But now I realize they were just a preparation because now every time I go into uh, a dating world or relationship or whatever, it's it's different because I learned something uh, more and I'm not I'm trying not to carry what I had from the previous you know uh, and that's the way to go forward right and each time uh, you go that's first. amazing yeah yeah <clears throat> it's beautiful how life works like that, isn't it? Because we do hear about these patterns where they keep getting with the same type of person. And that's because life will keep giving you the same opportunity. So that's why we do teach to bring it all home to you and, and get, get into you and see what's happening to you. Because this will keep playing out. You'll just get another opportunity. It might look a little bit different maybe, but the, at the core of it, whatever that is, it, it's life saying, look at this thing. You know, this is separating you from yourself and from, from feeling true love and happiness. We're going to give you another opportunity to look at that and for some people unfortunately they need a lot of that you know yeah, I was of one of them like it it takes a lot for me to change when I change I'm I'm right there and I'm I'm you know right behind it but I needed a lot of lessons you know some people are that way some people are like got the lesson thank you on to the next yeah. brilliant you know and they can really alchemize it and some people struggle more with that yeah so why do things often go still in a relationship? You know, a lot of it can do to do with this honeymoon period, like Mickey was talking about, this first three to 24 months when all the love chemicals are in, everything's absolutely great. And then after that time period, so depending on when that is for a person, then all this stuff will start to come up out of the unconscious and I think when people are not aware that this is happening then what can happen is then they start to grow apart and they start to separate and I think you know that uh, that can always look very different depending on the dynamic of the of both people but, but then oftentimes resentment starts um you know the sex life stops happening um, there is actually there's two hormones that are released during orgasm so if you're intimate with your partner there's oxytocin which is like the cuddle bonding hormone um, and then there's another hormone called vasopressin 
mm. which is released. And interestingly, vasopressin, they found Every, every human has vasopressin in their bodies and they looked at these prairie voles and there's a certain type of prairie vole that has um has higher levels of vasopressin and they're monogamous in their in their world and there's these other two types of prairie voles that are not monogamous and they injected this vasopressin into them and they became monogamous so if you are no longer being intimate together or not as much as you were and the orgasms are not happening then you can start to grow apart for that reason as well because these i think they refer to them as commitment hormones they they de deplete in in your relationship so if you're starting to grow apart and you know there's been a lot of arguments and a lot of resentment going on and the intimacy is gone then i think that's one of the reasons where things where you can start to grow apart and obviously then especially if someone does then lead to do you know infidelity or or something like that that's really difficult to come back from for a couple and then another thing i would say when it goes stale from the the way that i'm interpreting that word as well is there's two things it either loses the polarity the sexual attraction so if that's two people both in their masculine or two people both in their feminine uh, there's no polarity so it'll go stale it'll just be like very wishy-washy neither here nor there and another one is if if the people don't know themselves very well the conversations are going to be very shallow and that's going to wear thin pretty quickly so um if you want your relationship to go deeper and to not go stale we need to work with masculine feminine polarity and we need to really like get to know each other deep deep conversations which you means know. needing to get to know yourself deeply. Means deep needing to get to yeah. know yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's, so that's, that's been a big it. one for me in our yeah. relationship is the the depth that I was able to go was not very deep. I mean, literally, you could have asked me, you know, what, what was a hobby of mine or my favourite colour or something like that. And I'm like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And it's like, how can you have a deep, intimate conversation with someone that's not really explored the depths of anything? You know? Yeah. So um, that's definitely something that we cultivate in a relationship because I wouldn't be able to meet Mickey there in the yeah. intimacy yeah. side of things because he's all about that that self re uh, reflection and, um, and and exploration. Aren't you? Yeah, and conversations so. just don't get boring. Yeah, like yeah. you can explore the depths of stuff, and I know like you as well. I bet you've had some interesting conversations about you know the universe, what's out here and what's yeah. in here. And, oh, <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I can't. I can't get. I, I feel just, like I'm. I'm on a. I'm on a boat where I cannot get get in a relationship. We can't if you can't have a deep conversation. Yeah, <laughs> I cannot absolutely. do it. You need absolutely. to explore. Or I can't just. Uh, you know, if someone is there and and, he, and they say, oh, "Well, this is the way I am," and not look at it, I was like, "No, no," because, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> because like, okay, no, no. When you're with me, well, you're gonna be looking at your your nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah because that this is why we we want to attract um you know people who are on a conscious and a spiritual path really you know who know yeah. how to deal with the the internal work and um you can go the distance now you know many people go through a really bad breakup right and they stay sing single for a long time and they close their heart to a possibility to love again what sort of work could they do to open their hearts uh, so they can they can feel that soul fulfilling love again? Oh, there's loads. Um, <clears throat> first thing I would say, there's, there's, there's different components to this because emotionally we want to be okay with it, mm -hmm. but also physically, there's something happens physically. Um, so yoga is amazing for actually getting the, getting the heart open, using breath work, using postures, using mudras, hand movements that open it. So that's like the physical side. Also, you can do things like trauma release to get the stuff out, you know, to get trauma out of the body. Emotionally, forgiveness, acceptance, um, what we call the alchemy. So it's like recognizing, like we said before. So if I take away that what I thought the purpose of that relationship was, scrap that, start again. What was the actual purpose of the relationship? What has it taught me that is a positive lesson that I can take forward? And we, we pull the gold out of it, recognize the beauty of it, and then start to forgive, start to accept that's how it was. There was a gift in it. It's actually served me in the long run. And the other thing is building trust in ourselves to know that we can deal with whatever life throws at us. 
and and not only be okay with it but thrive because of it so we do it with that that last relationship i now i can see why this is helping me thrive and then we take action on that mm. and then we take that into any relationships going forward so then we, we're not scared right we can go in realizing we have nothing to lose and everything to gain mm. and so for me that is how that's how i open the heart because i'm currently opening my heart my personality type has a repressed heart center and so it's take it takes a lot of work to open open it up and to be able to relate deeply with people and um so i can absolutely say the physical stuff is imperative you need to do the physical stuff but also it's um yeah it's it's not being afraid of people recognizing that everybody's here to help us unlock something within ourselves and that changes that that for me has been a big a big part of the heart opening process that changes everything yeah and i think like um there's so many people who take uh, an idea of an old relationship into a new relationship and mm -hmm. every single person is different your new relation will relationship will be completely different to the old one but because it was bad or toxic or something they'll take it and they'll it, it, it will just carry like you said before about the patterns it'll just keep on repeating the patterns. so sometimes it's you actually sabotaging the relationship and not the other person yeah. yeah, I kind of put a um, phrase out about this, you know, what we think about will bring about as well. And so if you do bring it into your next relationship and, you know, say, for example, it's you are thinking that I bet they would be better off with somebody else. Um, whenever, you know, if you think about something like that, you you become hyper vigilant and sensitive to that and you're looking to be proven right. The brain likes to to be proven right. And so you'll look for for you know seeing signs that yeah they'd rather be with someone else and your partner can feel that you know they can feel that on some level whether it's really overt they can see it because you've actually voiced it and you've made it known you've asked them would you rather be with that person or you're asking them to bring give you reassurance that no i, I want to be with you um if that kind of thing's playing out in your relationship it can it's like a, a downward spiral from there because it just gets draining for the other person. You know, if, if, if your ex did that, you know, it's like, well, I'm not them. And, but when you, you know, if you bring that in, you can end up, it'll end up going that way because they probably would end up preferring to be with someone else at mm. that point. If you are constantly saying, I bet you would, um, I need your reassurance from you. You know, they, I think another person's like, okay, I can see you're hurt here. So I'll, I will have, you know, love and compassion for that to a degree. But if it's a constant thing and it's never going anywhere, and it's then, becoming a problem and it's becoming a yeah, problem yeah. then i think unfortunately the thing that you fear the most will will come to fruition you yeah, know if, absolutely yeah if totally agree. Aware of it it, it kind of leads up to uh, your attachment styles as well doesn't it um so you know i really wanted to ask you about attachment styles because i'm diving deep into it right now because i was <laughs> just gonna just <laughs> i'm just i could get a phd in attachment styles right now <laughs> I just want to say, though, like massive kudos for you for that, because you've noticed something about yourself and you have dived in deep about it. And I encourage anyone that's listening, like, because you can feel very much like you're so out of control with this stuff. But just as you're saying, you're diving in deep and it's having a massive uh, impact yeah. on relationships for you. So I just wanted to to point that out. That Thank you. Good. Yeah. And it was you, actually, I was going through hell. It was you, Madhya, you need to look at this one. I was like, OK, what's this? OK, wrap it all. <laughs> <laughs> coming um yeah so obviously some of our listeners won't even know what attachment styles are so what are the attachment styles and why is it so important to learn about them yeah so shall i describe it a little bit yeah so yeah, essentially yeah. i mean if you look on the internet they're kind of described in different ways but the way that i learned it was is essentially for this secure so this is where you are you know comfortable within yourself in a relationship you're not really shaken about you're pretty secure and confident and know yourself um you don't really project onto a partner so there's secure and then there's anxious attached so this is where you need a lot of um, validation from the other person. Usually, um, you, you know, you're quite anxious in a relationship. You want if they don't message within a certain time, then that can bring up a lot of anxiety for you. And then there's the avoidant type where if normally an anxious person will get with an avoidant person. So if they get where someone's messaging in all the time or upset that they didn't respond in the right time, you know, timely manner 
then this is the avoidant type. They're like, oh, I can't deal with that. And they kind of pull away. And that's where this ghosting comes from. They're normally the people that will do that. And then the fourth one is anxious avoidant or the ambivalent one. And this is where it's more of a push pull. And you do a little bit of the anxious stuff, pull back when it's too much, when the other person comes back and does, you know, is, is too needy on you, then you pull back and it's this kind of dance that plays out. Um, but where it comes from originally is from when we were babies. Um, our attachment style is developed that early on. In fact, they did a study um, where they took these babies and put them in a room, these different different babies that they've been studying for a year and ones that they thought that had a secure mum, an anxious mum and a, an avoidant mum. And then with these babies, they had the mum in the room and watched them and watched their behaviour. And the anxious babies were not really wanting to go play. They were kind of around their mum all the time. The avoidant babies were quite content and happy, um, but they were, they'd usually go a little bit further away from mum than what you'd think. And the secure baby was kind of in the middle, maybe occasionally looking at mum and getting a little bit of eye contact and getting that look and like, oh, I'm happy and content now. I'm going back to it. Mm. Um, so then what happened was they had these, these mums leave the room and they watched the baby's behavior and the anxious attached baby could not play or do anything. They were all consumed. They were devastated. They were really, really ups overtly upset. You could see that. The secure babies, they say they played for a little bit and then they you know, would cry a little bit. Um, and then as soon as mom came in, they were soothed really quickly. That was one of the key things as well. The secure baby was like, ah, oh, I'm, I'm secure and go back off to play and quite happy. And the avoidant babies, they noticed they just carried on playing and they didn't do anything um they didn't cry when mum came back in the room they didn't bother they just carried on playing but the interesting thing is they tested them uh, their cortisol stress hormone levels and their heart rates and when the mum had left the room the baby's heart rates were really really high and their stress hormone was really really high and that's what creates these avoidant babies so they are still having a stress response they still are worried from an attachment standpoint their primary caregiver has left but unfortunately, it's really sad, I think, but they've stopped crying or they've stopped acting out so that you would see that there's a problem but because they've come to realize that no one's coming to, to mm -hmm. soothe them. No one's coming to pick them up and make them feel better. And they've learned that. So they're self-regulating. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of from a baby standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then obviously we go about through adulthood and depending on what our relationships are like it's either gonna you know help us heal this if we have some you know good healthy relationships or it's going to make these attachment attachment styles worse yeah. um yeah and we find yeah. that the avoidant always seems to get the bad rap you know like people who are anxiously attached often think that the people who are avoidant are just heartbreakers but when you know this you realize that you're both experiencing the same amount of stress just that one person doesn't show it and the other person does yeah and it's really important to to know that the other person uh, this is why I, I, kept, I kept saying that you know it's really important to know what your attachment styles are and what um you know what your partner's attachment style is you know how can uh people you know whether they're anxious or avoidant how can they move to secure is there a way they could move to secure is that a practical thing that they can do where, where I'm at with this, um, I would say the first thing to do is to not go straight in with, I want to become secure, but to go straight in with, I want to be okay with where I'm at first, mm -hmm. right? I don't want to keep telling myself that I'm broken and I need to be different. Mm -hmm. um, so I would start with, okay, when, when I'm in dating and this thing comes up, I get anxiety, I, I feel, and you want to get to know that extremely well. Like all the sensations that come up, you want to know exactly what it feels like in your body, where it lives, how it moves, what it's doing. You want to know the very earliest signs of that happening. So the moment someone maybe connects with you, you might be like, oh, I can start to feel shivers in my, my spine. I'm starting to feel like my heart's racing, my face maybe is flushing. Get to know it really well, objectively. Mm. And then you separate you from that. So you observe that. We call it subject to object. So all this stuff that's going on in the body, all this heartbeat, these worries, these panics, 
you are observing them. What does this feel like? Where is it? Does it have a shape? Does it have a color? Is it spinning? Is it jumping up and down? Is it spiky? Is it soft? Is it mist? Is it fluff? Whatever. You figure out exactly what it's like in the body. And just in doing that alone, we'll start to heal it. Mm. Just doing that, just getting to know it because you're listening to it. The way that the unconscious speaks to us is through sensation in the body and dreams. But like the sensation in the body is the unconscious speaking about things that the conscious mind doesn't know. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so when these sensations come up, it's the unconscious saying, trigger, problem, wound, I'm hurting here. Like, look at me, hello. And then by us just literally feeling it, that objectification of it is, I would say, I would liken it to when you're a baby and your parents, your caregivers, give you 100% of their undivided attention. So they're not saying, stop crying, stop acting up, you're getting you're getting in the way this is annoying you need to be different so if we're just saying i want to be more secure and we're thinking i need to get rid of all these feelings that's like taking that little kid who's struggling that bit the baby that emma was just talking about and when they're crying it's kind of like just pushing them away Mm. or saying stop it be different Mm. which is part of what causes the problem in the first place is the kids not feeling safe as they are and to be okay being themselves you know Mm -hmm. um this is what causes a lot of our life problems and so i would say yeah get to know those sensations just feeling them is the equivalent of being reparenting yourself picking that little you up and giving them a hug Mm. and saying it's okay i'm listening i'm here you don't need to do anything differently you just be you and i'll just hold you while you continue to be yourself Mm. and express exactly how you feel and there's absolutely nothing wrong with how you feel and there's absolutely nothing wrong with how you're expressing it Mm. and i would say make friends with that if anything's going to get you too secure i would say it's that Mm. but i would say don't do that to get to secure do it to make friends with how you are right now beautifully said and um i think ifs is really good as well to go in that part of you that feels abandoned or rejected or things like the ifs uh therapy is amazing um so you talked about quite a lot about the honeymoon period wears off you know um so when it does wear off how do you prepare for that moment and and how do you keep the relationship going after the honeymoon period um, I mean, it's a it's kind of a little bit of a repeat, I guess, in what we what we had said. It's like um, obviously being aware that it's going to happen. I think that's massive, knowing that this is going to happen because uh, when it does happen, you know, depending on like attachment styles and things like that, and your personality type, you might think that you've done something wrong, or you know, and and reading something that's not there. It's just the fact that these chemicals have settled down, and like Mickey said, they need to. And we've definitely felt that because we were going to get nothing done <laughs> if they didn't settle down. Um, you know, so it's it, you know, just being aware that that is going to happen, and then knowing that these things are going to come up aren't they that they're going to come up from the unconscious that that's that's um we 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 welcome that we expect that to happen you know russell brand does a really funny um uh what do they call it like stand up where he's talking about oh i'm sorry i forgot to show you all these and all these eels are coming out and (laughs) you know really really a dark stuff and you know I mean we joke about it but we do have stuff in the unconscious we're blind to it obviously that's why it's called unconscious mm. and um so yeah it's it's then you know hopefully if you've understood the 100% responsibility same team no projection then this is just alchemy like I can be free of all these things or like Mickey had just described as well not rejecting these things within us but making friends with them you know these anxieties and fears and insecurities that we have you know they've come from you know a lot of what's happened to us you know have a lot of love and compassion for them and allow them to be there within your body and I I know for my own self when I do that when I allow it and I'm not being like oh I don't like that I'm rejecting it it's just this vicious cycle of self berating about the fact that I've got this and it's not budging it's not going to go anywhere with that but when I'm like oh it's welcomed and I also realize it's mine I'm not going to make it Mickey's issue so it's not going to affect my relationship it it seriously releases its grip on it, your hold on you mm-hmm. and then you're just working from a completely different place because I am anxious attached as well like when I do the do the quiz but I think from a relationship standpoint if I didn't tell him I'm anxious attached I don't think he would 
be able to tell me that I am from my behavior. Well, I hope not. No, anyway, no. But, I mean, I am ne- I am needy in a sense, as in I I want a lot of love and affection. That's what I'm in a relationship for, you know. But I want to give a lot of love and affection yeah. as well, so it's perfect. And that's about the compatibility side of things. I want to be in his presence all the time. That's the type of dynamic that I've always wanted in a relationship, and he wants the same. Um, so yeah yeah and um, they, they they kind of do change over time don't they because i know um, i remember mickey mentioning in the course about um you you were anxious before as well and and but then now you're more secure so you know i think it depends on what who you are in a relationship with i guess and it's it's who the other person's bringing out as well and there's so much involved it's I think anybody who, who tries to give cookie cutter answers, you, you want to be dubious because it's different for everybody, depending on your type, depending on where you're at in your development, depending on what caused it in the first place. This is why when I give any, the closest thing I can to cookie cutter, it's always you be OK with you as you are right now. Mm. <laughs> that's that's the only thing I could say is a good start. But even then, it's that alone might not work because you might have a really, really strong narcissistic tendency or something like that. Um, I know for myself, I'm, I'm naturally really, really selfish. I need to catch myself not being selfish, uh, to, to not be selfish and to catch myself being it. Um, so I think, yes, uh, cookie cutter answers are um, they're gonna fall short. We need to know our personality type. We need to know who we are. We need to know where we're at. And once we have all that, we can start to then cultivate whatever we want in our life from that place. And that's conscious relationship as well. Mm -hmm. For example, some people like me, I need to shut up a bit and listen. That's Mm -hmm. the best way I could communicate is to shut up and listen more. Mm -hmm. And for Emma, her her communication skills for her is to speak up more. Mm -hmm. And... So, and that might change at some point. It might be for me to start speaking more and it might be for you to listen more and it changes, doesn't it? So it's difficult to give someone like a a very specific response to this, which is why we do a course. Yeah. That's why we do it because there's so many nuances, if you know what I mean. It's like, yes, it's this, but if this is the case, then that's actually the opposite. And yes, the answer to this is kind of this, but then there's a few things that could make it the answer, the opposite for you personally. And, and this is why in a course, we, we spend 13 weeks going over it yeah. step by step by step. So people understand the nuances and things and like that. And I think that. that speaks to as well, all the dating <coughs> advice and, and stuff that you can look up out there that about the cookie cutter thing where it doesn't work for all different, for different people. Yeah. Like our our style and and the type of teaching that we do a lot of people won't resonate with that whatsoever but then there's like another um camp if you like that are like stand this way do this thing look this way don't do that don't um give yourself over unless you've got x y and z make sure you check for this watch for this and that's it you know and i'm not um, saying that that doesn't have its place for some people where they're at it's that's exactly perfect what it's what yeah it's what they need yeah. um yeah. so yeah it just shows that it's not cookie cutter it's so different for everybody so wherever your heart feels pulled into into learning more about it and it feels right for you then you know that's that's your path isn't yeah it? yeah um what i would say is use the honeymoon period to get to know each other and to make sure that you know how each other receive love look at learn about love languages learn about driving instincts learn about what it is that that person is driven towards instinctually are they are they all about self-preservation are they really in, more about intensity and attraction and magnetism are they more about social uh, settings they'd like to be out socially and it's like what what are they being driven to and so it's just so there's no surprises when the honeymoon period wears off mm. <clears throat> excuse me and you're both going back to your normal lives a little bit more, but together, what does that look like? Where are they going to go back to? What was it? What's life like when they're not with you before they were with you? It's like, we really want to know this stuff. Mm-hmm. Just so we, when it wears off, we're not like, oh, well, I thought you were different, but now I'm realizing you want to go to all the football games, for example, and you like to hang out at the pub three times a week. Mm-hmm. And this might be a social person that likes to go out and do social things. And when the honeymoon period wears off, they want to go back out and do those things. And you're like, oh, they've taken all the love away. What happened to all the affection, to the love, to the time that was spent together? And it might absolutely not be a reflection of how much they love you in the slightest. It's purely that's just how they are. 
Yeah, I guess is it to. is it really important after the honeymoon period to be more compatible? So I think that's when compatibility kind of just comes first, doesn't it? I think you're going to see more long-term compatibility because obviously there's compatibility where it's like for your hot and I agree and yeah. you know we're going to hook up. Um, so there's that side of compatibility in there but when all this other stuff is coming up it's kind of like that's the time to have the test if you like if you mm. want to refer to it as that that's where you're really going to see are you actually compatible because obviously if you're willing to look at this stuff and want to evolve and grow but your partner's not then not very compatible at that point because yeah. there's going to be a lot of resentments that go on there and I was actually just speaking to someone the other day and she said you know I, I'm all for growth like we have issues like let's let's do something about it I'm all about that but she said my partner is totally withdrawn and doesn't want to speak about anything she's like I can't work with that I can't do anything with that and that's you that's know that's you've got to I'm, make a choice yeah and I'm not I'm not saying that he's doing anything wrong for being that way that's that's how he copes with things and that's what he does but it's like where can you go from there together as a couple it's really really difficult to, mm. to work with yeah um, yeah that's an interesting one you know we've been asked that you know does my partner need to be on the spiritual journey if i am and we spoke about it and we would say absolutely yes yeah yes or if it's not spiritual even if it's just personal development like mm. both partners need to be on it because i was never with anybody who was and that's how we broke up pretty much every time growing apart because i was changing quite a lot and they were staying very similar to yeah. how they were and that would keep keep happening and keep happening. Yeah. And that was what when we got together. I was like, I need someone who's going to grow with me. That's a need. And yeah, I guess I guess that's uh, another thing that happens is um, when one of them goes through their own proper spiritual awakening and say, for example, they don't believe in anything and the other one just still stuck, then I guess you're not on the same wavelength anymore. It's exactly the same situation, mm -hmm. isn't it? So you have to go off. And I guess... Like you said before, they come in for a bit, you one of them is gonna have a spiritual awakening and it's not gonna work and then they're gonna go off different ways and you know, um, unless you're, you're a twin flame, may come back together <laughs> again when the other one has a <laughs> spiritual awakening. Um, so why, why is feminine and masculine energy so important in a relationship? Now I'm not talking in a sense of a man and a woman. It could be a woman and a woman, man and a man, because we both carry masculine and feminine energies. So why are the role so important? Uh, so first of all, um, just in case anyone doesn't know, let's just talk a little bit about what these energies are and how they're different. So feminine energy, first of all, I'll start with this metaphor that I always use because it's the best one I've heard, which is a river. River banks are masculine energy, and the river itself is the feminine energy. And you can see that the masculine energy is strong, it's firm, it's stable, it's structured, it has direction, it goes from here to here, it knows exactly where it's going, and it's it stays that way, right? It, it, it knows its place, it's firm and strong. And the feminine energy is different. The feminine energy is, is the water running through, it, it's flows, it's sponta uh, spontaneous, has spontaneity, it's uh, full, it's flowing, it's uh, alive. And, and so you imagine that going through, bouncing off everything, um, flowing with what's coming up in life, whereas the masculine energy is the container. So this is what, it, this is what they look like. So in terms of feminine energy, you imagine someone who's perhaps kind of playful, inviting, receptive, loving, and um full of energy and love and movement right this is all fe feminine energy and then the masculine energy is way more um about making decisions having direction having a safe container protecting the feminine and the fe feminine supports the masculine so when we understand what the energies are like that's when we can see that we, we all have both right so it's like we all have intuition which is feminine but we all have the ability to analyze which is masculine Hmm. so i would say when we start to balance that in ourselves once we have access to both masculine and feminine we can use our intuition and make decisions and take action we can have a structure for our life and a strong direction but within that we have the ability to flow and pivot as an entrepreneur you might want to pivot your business and change it within the confines of but i'm still heading in this direction when, when we've got access to both these energies then we can choose them on demand we can say 
this situation calls for feminine energy. I'm going to use my feminine energy in this situation. And maybe the, a day later, we might spend all day in our masculine because that's what it calls for. That ability to switch between them gives us the opportunity to choose to be attracted and attractive in relationships. So we can choose to be attractive when we know if someone's in their masculine or feminine, we can jump into the, the polar energy and that will create attraction immediately. So we can, we can choose to, like we said, relationships go stale. If we understand masculine and feminine and we've developed the ability to jump between them, we can choose to be attracted and to, to keep that magnetism there. So I'd say that's why it's a big deal because that is what's happening in relationships. That's the dance. That's what keeps people together. And when that's gone, the people drift apart. And like you, you talk about, don't you? Like if there's too much masculine energy and you're all bank and no river, then it's dry. And if you're like both in your feminine, for example, then the water is going everywhere. It's overspilling. There's no direction. Yeah. There's so yeah. emotion within that relationship that that don't work either. So it is all about this uh, polarity and having yeah. this balance. And to the point that even me and Mickey, we find that if we're both working and we're, we, that's bringing a lot of masculine energy, if we're both in our masculine, then usually we end up going into separate rooms so that we can both be in our masculine energy because when we're together side by side trying to work with that, we've come to realize that what, either one of us is not getting something done. Um, one of us will automatically drop into the feminine when the yeah. other's in the masculine. And so the feminine gets less done. Um, the masculine is doing and the feminine is receiving, receptive. Which is normally me. I'll drop into my feminine and I'll just listen to him because I can tell he wants to tell me about this thing he's doing and he's all excited about it. But then I've got things I want to do. So then it's like, ah, I see what's happening. And, and so, you know, we, we separate in that moment so we can both be effective and, and get stuff done. Yeah. So, and then we'll just check in and we'll do the more feminine stuff the more sort of brainstormy and talking about it and opening up ideas and flowing with what's coming up in the moment which is more feminine energy yeah fantastic um so i've heard about tantric intimacy quite a few times on a being on a spiritual journey can you explain to us what it is and why it's important this is an odd one actually for us to speak about and i'll tell you why because dun, dun, dun. <laughs> uh, well we're not trained in tantra but it happens anyway um this started happening again it's probably the twin flame thing I, I've, I've read about it when i've read about twin flame stuff so once i had this kundalini activation and then when emma and i got together it it jumped across and activated Emma as well. Mm. So then she started to have these automatic body movements. And then at one point we came together after Emma had finished work and I was not working, I was in the US. So I was just letting these movements, these automatic movements take over for hours and hours each day. And then um, when Emma came home from work, we came together, I gave her a hug and my body started to adjust her body. So it started to adjust her spine. And then I realized that it was, I could feel all her meridians, all her energy channels in her body. And suddenly it was, my body was just making adjustments like a chiropractor on Emma and it just knew how to do it. So this we came to realize is Tantra. Mm -hmm. uh, this was only around the first, you know, we didn't even know what Kundalini energy was at this point, mm -hmm. did we? It was eight months after my activation that I learned what was happening. Mm -hmm. I learned about Kundalini. And then it was almost around that time that Tantra started happening, weren't it? So sometimes it's sexual, but it's not always sexual at all. It can be completely non-sexual. Um, you know, it can be hands-off orgasmic energy, which we've had, mm -hmm. or it can just be, completely almost cold just movements uh, that adjust the spine adjust the hips adjust the shoulders and just does all yeah. this stuff yeah. um but then when it's sexual as well it's uh, it's extremely profound in that it's kind of like using um breath work or using deep deep states of meditation or using entheogens plant medicines it can be kind of a mind-blowing experience mm. um so why is it important what we know of it so far from learning and studying yoga 
and from the Tantra that we've been reading about. We have a book right here, actually. <laughs> this one's about the sexual side of Tantra, sexual secrets. Um, so we're kind of learning about it retrospectively and then figuring out what it is that's been happening between us. And Tantra is, is about the energy that's running through the body, right? The life force, the prana, the chi, uh, whatever people give it different names. And these wounds that we spoke about. So for example, if you have an attachment style of anxiously attached, this is almost like kind of a wound that we have. Mm. Um, Tantra is sending healing energy to all our wounds. Our wounds tend to show up as blockages in our energy channels in the meridians. And the way that we had it described to us was imagine like a blocked hose pipe and then getting uh, a piece of wire and sticking it down and blasting it through and disintegrating and dissolving the blockage, breaking the blockage so that it works again. Tantra is kind of doing that. Yoga is doing that. Breath work is doing that. Pranayama is doing that. It fires up the life force, clears the channels, and then the wound is, is healed. So I don't know how well I described that, probably really, a little bit around the houses. I think but... people who are probably tapping into it right now, <laughs> they were like, you know, they would understand it better because you just yeah. described it. They might have a better they might have a better way of describing it as yeah. well, but this is what we've seen to be true. So for example, um, sex becomes sacred sex at this point, mm. um, where it's, it's as much a healing modality as it is a pleasurable uh, thing to do as much as it is a, a, a way that we connect. So sex and intimacy becomes multifaceted. There's lots of different reasons why it happens. And, and I'd say Tantra is when it's, it's a healing modality yeah. and an evolutionary as well. Like it's unlocking spiritual gifts within us. Yeah. Deepening yeah. our existing spiritual gifts. Um, so I wouldn't say it's essential in a relationship. And for some people, it's probably just way outside of their remit of what they're capable of or want to do because it's just not their path in this life. Mm. Um, but I think if you're at all pulled towards it and you're into energy, um, and you were in a conscious couple, I would absolutely recommend it, mm. like moving into it. It's so, yeah. Yeah. so exciting and so powerful. Yeah. So in your view, what should relationships be like? Well, that's a tricky question. Um, I think it's a very individual, individual question, um, you know, because it's what, what should it be like for you? I think whenever we start to think about um, what it's like for other people and that we should have that. And um, I think it's just very much bringing it home to you and and what is it for you because and not to make that wrong because it certainly isn't the same for everybody um it's knowing what what the purpose of your relationship is is for you personally and and then going from there That's my answer to that would be growth facilitating That's oh what yes should be. absolutely totally agree. i mean I, I think they always are personally whether you realize yeah. it or whether not you realize it or <laughs> It will be growth facilitating, whether, you know, yeah. it's a painful growth um, because you have to learn this lesson, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. Okay, so let's talk about uh, your course. It's called Awakening in Relationships. So why did you choose that name and what's it all about? Uh, so we chose Awakening in Relationships because much like a spiritual awakening, which, you know, I think a lot of your people, you know, the audience listening to this will have heard of that term, where all of a sudden the blindfold comes off the blinkers, you see a whole new world. That's what we want to bring for people throughout the course is the awakening in relationships, because we're really not taught this stuff most of us don't really have good role models you know it's not really spoke about in schools or anything like that of what they should look like I think you know me personally um you know not that um my, I mean my parents are still together but looking back you know at their relationship it's um you know it, it works for them and everything but it's just you know what watching how it is for them and you know what I want in my relationship is just totally totally different so I think um yeah the awakening in relationships is all around that is just to take the blinkers off for you to um get a load of information because it is quite information dense in the in the beginning you get to understand a lot of things a lot about what we spoke about today you know the um the compatibility and how you can tell if someone's compatible with you or not but then we then dive in and you get really deep in knowing yourself 
in the throughout the course and then you know what we spoke about on here as well of getting really clear on what it is that you want what's the purpose of your relationship and really diving into that and um and resolving a lot of these things you know a lot of these things that come up for you and and how how to uh alchemize them how to transcend them um and we do literally in the 13 week course go through a process of awakening yeah. So it's taking it's taking the spiritual awakening concept, applying it to relationships, and then it's designed to go step by step through an awakening process as well. Yeah, it, it's an amazing, amazing course. We'll get to the contact details afterwards if you want to get involved uh, or if you want to join the course. Um, but before we go, um, I want to ask you some rapid fire questions. Now, I, I ask this to every single person so because I like grilling. <laughs> and so, you know, Mickey and I won't definitely need to do it. <laughs> so what happens, I'll, I'll ask you sets of questions and Mickey can go first and, and then I'm out, you know, whichever way. Okay, are you ready? Mm -hmm. cool so what is your definition of god <laughs> <laughs> the definition of god um <clears throat> it's the the container that life lives within mm. the, the infinite vastness of nothingness um but that houses the intelligence that life um, that life appears within and manifests within. Beautiful. What about you, Emma? Um, it's, kind of, it's funny, isn't it? You know, depending on your upbringing, hearing the word God, it's it's not something that I was used to, to hearing and had a little bit of um, an allergy to it. But like, oh, God, that thing. God, that thing. <laughs> um, I guess for me it is um, realizing that everything is God. Everything is one um uh, every, you know i realize that the, the god lives within me uh it's in everything it's everything that i see it's a reflection of everything i think that's what it is for me is is just oneness it's beautiful so what do you think happens when you die uh <clears throat> i think you go to <laughs> wow, these are good i think you go to that space where i <clears throat> when i met my guides and they operated on my body I think I go back up and see those guys for a little while <laughs> and then I think I come back into another life now I do wonder if that other life is going to be chronologically aligned or if my next life might be 10,000 years ago I don't know oh my god oh my god but reincarnation <laughs> beautiful fifth dimension oh no what is it 11th dimension and then come back again <laughs> well, i have a feeling we might go like through all the people and then i think we might become a planet in a, in a, a future <laughs> oh, that would be so we awesome. are all the people and then the goal is for the <clears throat> the planet and all its inhabitants to become enlightened so yeah. in a single life we become enlightened when we're a planet it all becomes enlightened then it's a whole enlightened solar system then a whole <laughs> enlightened galaxy that's what i think happens beautiful so. man i love that what about you, Emma? Um, you know, I used to say like, oh, I don't really believe in anything like that, but I love the idea of it. I, I don't want to think that this is just it, but um, probably in the, you know, since I have become more spiritually awakened, I definitely feel like there's something more than this, this physical, you know, world that we're on here. What is it then? Um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're getting to it. That was my build up. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I think... <laughs> I think we do, we have been together, you know, I think families, I think the, you were definitely together before, maybe yeah. a different dynamic, maybe, you know, you're my sister in this life, but past life, you were my mother or something like that. And I think as well, I don't know, I'm just kind of still playing with this thought, this notion but that we're here to do a certain thing. And I think if we complete that, I'm not so sure that we would come back down onto this physical earth to, to, to do that. If we've actually finally got to that point, I think we then um, can, can be up there and be more the overseers and, and, and watching. And um, have you seen that movie, Soul? Uh, you know, the Disney. Oh, yes. Oh, my God. I love it. That's what happens. <laughs> exactly. 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 What's <laughs> I should have just said that, man. would have been really... <laughs> Yeah, that was such a beautiful movie. Such a beautiful movie. animated. I love it. Um, okay, so how do you? De this is this is gonna be like. Uh, okay, so very quickly, how do you define religion and spirituality? I'd say spirituality is um, doesn't have rules, hmm. and religion has rules. 
that would be the difference to me yeah yeah I mean I definitely agree with that I think when I personally think of religion um if it's if someone's really heavy within that religion I think they can be really quite closed Mm. and and quite rigid within that that's been my experience with the religion whereas I think spirituality is a little bit more open and everything's kind of welcomed and I think in spirituality we come to realize that essentially we're all talking about the same things but everyone's just using different words and different languages and looking at a different ideology and a different um you know we're worshiping something different but ultimately it is the same yeah. but I think somebody that is more religious perhaps may not like that you know if they think that theirs is the one true way I'm not saying all religious people are that way um but that's what I think of when I'm I'm thinking of the difference between the two yep so what's the lesson that took you longest to learn <sighs> these are so good <laughs> uh, there's one that I am I have not I've not quite nailed it yet and it's um it's part of my personality type and that is that variety the variety isn't necessarily sorry the spice of life Mm -hmm. it's not always about variety it's not always about having more opportunity but it's Mm -hmm. taking one opportunity and going really deep with it oh yes oh that's beautiful that's beautiful I think mine, mine definitely ties into my personality as well. Uh, we refer to personalities a lot because we do, we do work with that um, a lot, the Enneagram. And I think mine is probably realizing that I matter has been probably my uh, biggest and hardest lesson of you know, my past relationships and where I've kind of put myself on the back burner and not expressed myself and my needs and just mm. kind of gone along with everything so I think to get to almost 40 years old now and I think that's what life was showing me for me to understand my my significance and my importance in this life and and I think yeah I'm not all the way there yet either with that still still something that's difficult um you know it's I think depending on your upbringing you think that can be quite arrogant to think about yourself your your needs your wants your desires um at least it was for me so so that is probably been mine yeah i think mine as well because i'm the same personality type as you (laughs) yeah it's been um okay so i'm fully in present moment when um i'm fully in the present moment during orgasm (laughs) amazing oh my god okay How am I supposed to beat that? <laughs> um, um, I'm, I guess I'm fully present. You know, I think a time when I've experienced it outside of orgasm <laughs> and um, is when I'm in service. You know, like when we've yeah. done retreats or something like that, and we're in, and we're um, especially in person. I would say that my heart is so wide open and then I'm, I'm there I'm there for the person I'm there for what's wanting to happen what's wanting to come through um yeah I think that's probably one of the times where I felt fully present other than plant medicine when it's like freaking hell it's brought me into the room and <laughs> I'm present then all right but that's a little bit of a rougher, a rougher ride but I think that okay um so do you believe there is an end to healing um, I think there's a, a moment when we switch the name from healing to evolving. Mm-hmm. So yes, if you look at it that way. Okay. Yeah, yeah that's interesting because I think we do, um, you know, throughout this journey, I think there seems to be seasons for that where you feel like you're in that a lot and there's a lot of healing going on and then it seems to rest a little bit and then you might seem to kind of go back back into that and there's actually a certain stage of consciousness where it's all about healing and it's all about going in and and feeling whole again and getting all this stuff out Mm. um so yeah i don't know if i really (laughs) there's there's in the the world of integral they say um wake up grow up Mm. clean up and show up Mm. now the way i see that is that when we're awakening that's part of the healing, the sort of thing we awaken. Growing up is when we become mature cerebrally and mentally. Um, and then clean up is when we do all the inner work, the trauma release, letting go of all the judgments and forgiving and everything like that. And then I believe that show up is when you that's when you're more in evolution mode. You're showing up, you're self-actualized and you're showing up as you. 
So I'd say that point when we go from clean up to show up is when we go from healing to evolving. Oh, beautifully said. The world needs more of what? Conscious relationships. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> But I'll tell you why, just re very quickly, the reason why is because the only problems that exist in the world are in the human mind, right? That is yes. the, yes. a problem until a human says that's a problem. Yeah. So the only way to heal the problems in the world is to heal the human psyche. And the only way to do that is to get right to the very root of it, which is newborn babies, parents. Mm. So it's like create conscious couples who have a massive amount of love and respect for each other that then the child will have a massive amount of love and respect for themselves mm. because they see half of them as mum, half of them as dad or whatever, they then realise they're made of these two people. When they, So when they see two really healthy individuals, they will be healthy. Mm. And they will also know what a healthy relationship looks like and they will bring that to it. So yeah. I feel like this is how we heal all the world's problems, conscious yeah. relations. Yeah, absolutely. So, and it's not something it's taught in schools, and which is so annoying. You know, we're mm -hmm. we're taught to go out there, do this, that, that, the other. But relationships is the most important thing, not just your with your partner romantically, but like all areas. Um, you know, you have to be working on it. Yep. Um, so, what is what is one message that you would like to share with someone who's going through adversity, who's going through their spiritual awakening, or lost in life? What would you tell them right now? Do you want to go first or do you no, want me to? I would say there's there's one thing that makes all the difference and it's the earnest, the purity of seeking, how much you actually mean it deeply. Mm. So are you still trying to get something? Like when you're going through this adversity and you're doing this work, are you still trying to get something for you? Is it more of a selfish thing? Like, oh, if I... If I get better at this, I'll get more, more girls, I'll get more guys, or I might be able to attract more money into my life. You're still in the process of trying to get, 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 or are you earnestly wanting to, to know God, you know, to know love, to know the purest form of love and, and to connect with the essence of who and what you are. It's how much you mean it, the purity of that intention. Mm. I would say focus on that. Yeah. Um, I think I would say maybe, um, a community this is something that when I was going through adversity that I wouldn't reach out to anybody really really private really felt alone and I would say if you're going through adversity your best friend is reaching out to people in you know within the community like oh, thank god we have internet now it's so broad you know like i know if mickey was a different person going through his kundalini spiritual awakening he would have thought he were going mad you know in, in some of the things that was happening and um you know fortunately he's got you know he's got that about him that he was like something real is happening here i'm gonna go research and i'm gonna go explore this thing um, so I'd say that, you know, from a person, like I say, that went through it all alone, I think I stayed a lot longer in a really unhealthy relationship because I felt very alone. You know, obviously I created that situation. So I would say reach out to a community. There's like whatever your your issue with that you're working with, there's there's somebody out there that can assist you that they've either been through it or something like that. And obviously we can you can do a lot of things privately, can't you, if you're not at the point where you want to put you know people to publicly know that you're struggling with this or that so I would say like take a little bit of a load off and, and if you can reach out and get and get some help in whatever area it is that you that you're struggling with yeah absolutely thank you um so how can people contact you and if they want to take on the course where did they go to uh, Facebook is is pretty much where we live. Um, that's like where we provide a ton of value for people. Uh, we post usually multiple times a day, you know, and uh, we're always open for chats and di you know dialogue on their Facebook Messenger or anything like that. Um, so there really is the best place. Um, so I'm Emma Groves on there, and um, he's Mickey, Mickey Owen. Mickey Owen, Mickey with an E. Mickey with an E, yeah. Not <laughs> Mickey. 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 Mickey <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, amazing. So that's the best place. Yeah, just reach out to us and then drop us a message and we'll we'll just go from there. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, so we just come to an end of the interview now, guys. Oh my god, it's been absolutely mega amazing. I mean, uh, I, I just honestly didn't. I wanted to. I wanted to ask you so many more questions, but you know, um, next maybe we can get you in another series. 
So thank you so much for coming on this podcast, guys. It, like I said, absolute honor uh, interviewing you and you guys carry so much knowledge and wisdom of relationships. That's just, it, it's just amazing, incredible, you know? And like I say, t- when I see you guys, you're my relationship goals. <laughs> so we're all working towards you guys <laughs> right now. And your your love for each other is just incredible, incredible to see and um, evolving, uh, you know? Uh, so yeah, thank you so much. Is there anything else that you would like to say? Uh, just thank you as well thank you to you for this opportunity for us to talk about these things and thank you to any listener that's made it all the way through to this point yeah. if you are still here and you're still with us and um you know no matter where you're at on the continuum of your life I hope there was a little bit of something in there for you uh, that spoke to you and, and I would say um whatever it, whatever it takes to find yourself and if relationships is your vehicle, then that's your vehicle. For someone else, it might be trauma. For someone else, it might be something else. Um, but yes, keep keep your eye on the prize. And it's all about reconnecting deeply with, with ourself, with essence. And relationships are brilliant for that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. So much love. Thank you so much for listening to Soul Awakenings with Madhya Sosan podcast. I would love to know what your biggest takeaway from this conversation has been. Share your thoughts on my Facebook and Instagram, Madhya Sosan. You can also check out my website, madhyasosan.com. If you would like to watch this episode, then head over to my YouTube channel, Mads Corner, M-A-D-Z Corner. If you enjoyed this episode, then please do rate and share this with your family and friends. Thank you once again, and I will see you on the next episode.